My all-time pet peeve when it comes to historical fashion is when people will say that, oh, I can't do this or that era because I don't have the body for it. Because this myth of that idealized whatever body, perfect part body for whatever era, it never existed. Or, well, I mean, they did, of course they had an idealized body, but 90% of people never were that. They aren't that today, and they weren't that in the past. People just don't change their body shape or type, just depending on what's fashionable. Hello and welcome, I'm Maria from Sew so Through Time, and this time we're talking about the 1920s ideal body shape and look and how to achieve that look when you don't have that ideal body shape. And we're making the undergarments to form that proper silhouette for the 1920s. Let's start by clearing up one thing. People weren't that much smaller in the past. We have this myth of people being, oh, so much smaller and the vintage body, but it really is just a myth. If you look at average height, I am, well, I mean, there's variation from country to country, but I am 5'4", so I'm either average or slightly below average today, depending on what country you look at for a woman. And if you look at what I would have been in the 1920s, still, I would be about the average for most countries. And even as far back as the Tudor era, my height would be about average or slightly above average, but still in within the scope of average height for a woman, even that far back. So even though, yes, there is a tendency towards taller people, it isn't actually by much on average. And as for clothing size, if you look at portraiture and picture evidence we have of people in the past, you can see that people came in all different body shapes, different sizes, just like today. The one big reason why we have this idea that people were so much smaller back then is because of surviving garments. There's so many tiny garments that survive. But the big reason for this is because if you think of what you leave in your closet year after year, no matter if it fits or not, they're the sentimental pieces. You know, your prom dress, your wedding dress, things like this that, especially in the past, m most of those events tended to happen fairly early in life. And you don't fit into them anymore, but you keep them because of the sentimental value that that garment has. And that's also true for people in the past, even more so because garments were expensive and people used them till they were actually done. Then after they was not no longer good as a garment, it was often used as rags and things. So there literally was nothing left of most garments that most people would wear. Okay, so we've established that all bodies, despite their size or appearance or whether they have a nat naturally fashionable body or not, wore the fashions. So what is the 1920s fa fashion silhouette? Because the first image you get into your mind most likely is actually wrong. Because the, the idea that most of us have about what is the 1920s look is a very straight, very short dress that usually has a lot of fringe on it. And that is actually the 1950s showgirl version of the 1920s flapper girl look, not the actual 1920s look. If we're talking about actual clothing that actual people were wore, not about burlesque or other showgirl outfits, the, the fashionable silhouette did at one point in the 1920s come to about knee height, but that was actually for only a few years. There's a lot of variation within the 1920s fashion era. That very straight, very short skirt silhouette was actually fashionable from only about 1927 to 28, 29, there-ish. So it was only fashionable for a few years. Before that, styles were very different. If we look at the very beginning of the decade, from 20 to uh, onwards, the silhouette is very much softer. It has a very blousey silhouette. And the skirts were a bit longer. They were about mid-calf. 
some daytime wear was slightly shorter and some evening wear was longer, but that's about the average wear it was, about mid-calf, up until about winter 22. When the silhouette starts, again, the hemlines drop and the silhouette gets even softer. There's still that blousey look on the top, but instead of having a more straight forward plain skirt, they go for a lot more drapery. When we get to 1925, the silhouette again becomes straighter and the hemline starts rising again. And from there on out, it works its way towards 1927 when the fashion really becomes that very straight, very severe, sort of boyish kind of straight lines with the short skirt kind of look that most people associate with 1920s. And then as we get on to 1929, again, the drapery comes in, the hemlines get longer, and we work our way towards the 1930s look. Okay, so how do you achieve these different kinds of silhouettes of the 1920s? If you're tall, slim, and your, your curves are very like straight up and down lines, then you're good to go. You're golden. Just throw on the dress and go. That's all you need. But for the rest of us, we do actually need undergarments and corsetry. Corsetry was a very important part of the 1920s silhouette. There is this kind of myth of that the corset disappears in the 1920s, but the thing that really disappears is the really heavily rigid boned structure that creates a very structured waist. That disappears. But the corset doesn't go anywhere, as in a garment that shapes your body and holds your lines smooth and also holds up your stockings, because that's the function of the corset in the 1920s. And also, it does try to start to change what we call it. So that is another big change happening. So instead of when it was previously always called a corset, now it starts being called a girdle. It doesn't really matter if it's 1920s or Victorian era or whatever era. Always the function of your corset depends a little bit on your body size and proportions. Mostly proportions because you're trying to achieve a fashionable look. And always the thing you need to remember about corsets, whatever era we're talking about, is that the bone structure underneath doesn't move. But the soft tissue, the flesh on top and the skin that is moldable, that moves. You can change how it looks on the surface even though the actual size of the person doesn't change. So for most women, the corset's job would be to smooth out any possible lines and make it so that your hip line, where the skirts come closer to your body, that that line is smooth and straight and when you move, there are no weird lines or bumps that are not a part of the silhouette that would become visible. And the other job is, of course, holding up your stockings. And because it, it is all about proportions, not about body size. So if you happen to be an apple shape or just have a bigger waist than you do hip, a hip area, then period manuals and ads will advise you to actually get a more structured corset that will actually reduce your waist one to three inches which is more typical of earlier eras for most body types but it was was still an advisable thing in the 1920s to get that correct silhouette because the silhouette underneath the clothing isn't actually completely straight it does have curves they're just very soft and they happen gradually so if your body type is in the other extreme of the spectrum, like mine, that you have a very huge difference between your waist and hips, as in your hips being bigger, and especially if you have a strong hip line, where, as like mine, where your upper hip is already significantly bigger than what your waist is, and that curve happens in a very short area, then what you will want to do is smooth out that line and make it appear less drastic. Because like I said, we want smooth lines. So then the corset won't cringe in your waist and it will most likely, like the waist part will actually sit on your rib cage, not your natural waist. 
making again the line appear longer and smoother and then it will most likely reduce your upper hip area because that area on the sides it's not that much flesh well it depends on your body but often there isn't that much flesh that you can comfortably squish but most of us do have our lower tummy also in that upper hip area and that does need to be smoothed out because we want the front also to be a fairly straight line and most of us curve out a little bit so that's where usually the reduction happens on a more curvy more pear-shaped lower body for my corset i'm using a 1922 pattern originally published in de Grazius and kindly provided for free online by Clusterfrock. The original pattern is slightly big on me, so I'm taking a little bit off the hip and about an inch off the waist altogether. And I redraw the lines keeping with the original gentle slopes of the pattern. For my fabric, I'm using a satin weave coutil. I start by sewing the boning channels for the lacing strips at the center back. for the short split busk in the front. Then I add boning channels to the middle of the front piece to help keep it smooth. So for the boning, this time I'm going to be using spiral steel. I normally don't like using this. I much prefer um, zip ties or plastic whalebone. But because for this type of corset, um, this actually, the spiral steel and the lack of memory in it is actually a good thing so I will be using spiral steel and I'm taking it out of a really really old mock-up I think I made this like 10 years ago and the stitching was all wonky and it never became anything so I get to repurpose the steels for that <laughs> Then I insert the boning into the boning channels, including the felled side seam. And finish off the edges with bias binding. Because this corset is not meant for waist reduction, it is laced in a slightly different pattern than your typical corset is. The lacing forms an X first on top of the corset and then below it. Lacing is also added to the front below the busk and garters are sewn to the bottom. And again, the same is true for your bust. The idea isn't necessarily to create a completely flat chest, but the idea is to create a smooth, gradual hill sort of bust instead of, or like a gradual mound instead of like 
a steep hill. So we want to create those gradual curves. So if you have a smaller size bust, you might have that naturally. But for a larger bust, that means more compression and you definitely don't want a large bust to be lifted up. You want it to be a gradual slope in both directions. So that means that you want to compress it lightly, but still keep that bust shape, a rounded bust shape, and keep it fairly low. So that's why for a lot of larger busted ladies or fuller busted ladies or stout brassiers, as they were called then, because again, the term stout doesn't actually refer to your body size in this instance. It is about your silhouette. So a stout lady could be very small with just a large bust, or a stout lady could be a larger lady. One type of brassiere that was marketed very often for the fuller sized lady was this kind of tank top looking thing where it comes from your bust all the way to your waist and then there's shaping in the form of waist darts to make it smaller to give you that natural very soft curve with a lot of chest compression. And this was very popular in both woven fabrics and also elasticated fabrics or even with like thick elastic strips coming along your bust. Another t common type of brassiere was the bandeau kind of brassiere. Those could come from anywhere from a very flimsy, lightweight lace and ribbon contraption to a heavy cotil one. Cotil is a specific corsetry fabric that is made because it is a very dense and strong fabric very, with very little give. And this is the style that I decided to make simply because I get very easily um, pain from impact pressure. And that's why I find a lot of like modern sports bras and bralette type of things uncomfortable, even for just lounging around the house, not to mention like actually dancing and going and doing things. So I figured this type of thing would maybe provide me better support for that like downward movement with still keeping with the proper silhouette of the era. For my brassiere, I'm using the Wearing History pattern. It is a reproduction pattern from 1921. And these do not come in cup sizes. They come in full bust sizes because it doesn't really matter so much what your actual bust size is compared to what your full bust size is. Because if you're a smaller cup but a larger rib cage, what you do is just have less compression. And if you're a smaller rib cage but bigger bust, then you'd have more compression. It doesn't like that doesn't matter so much. And because there's an underneath ribbon that goes on your lower bust, that angle will determine whether what cup size it is. So it's an easy to adjust thing as you go. It so even though this pattern was like recommended for I think a 34 double D and I am smaller on the band and much larger in the cup, it didn't matter. I didn't actually have to fiddle around with it much because, again, it's just compressing to that slight slope and spreading out the tissue so that the slope is more gradual. According to the pattern, I start by sewing bust darts onto the upper cup piece and onto the ribbon for the upper cup. The upper edge cup is supposed to be basted in with this ribbon. But the problem is that on both sides, it's about half an inch too short. So I'm gonna add, recut this with the half an inch extra. The bottom of the cup is shaped by curving the ribbon along the line indicated in the pattern. Then the ribbons are sewn onto the cup pieces. Then the bottom cup piece is gathered to match the upper cup piece. Then the two cups are sewn together and the band pieces top and bottom edge are finished with ribbon and the band sewn onto the cups and 
an elastic is added to the center back. And hooks and eyes for the closure. Then I made straps by folding the ribbon in half and sewing it shut. After trying on the brassiere, I took in the center front at the bottom edge to provide better support. Then I covered all the raw edges in bias binding. And because this is still an era where an important part of hygiene was the idea that you protect your clothes from your skin. That means all the dirt, the body oils, the sweat, everything your body produces, that was considered dirty and something you need to protect your outer garments from. So you would wear still most often something be between you and your girdle to protect your girdle from those said oils. And this protective garment in this era would most often be some sort of combination underwear. So basically like a chemise and those underpants combined. Very often they were made in the shape of either like pants with a tank top added to them or the other option is that it was a very straightforward kind of like slip type of dress in a very straight silhouette with a, just a band going in your crotch area and that would be buttoned on or snapped on usually to use the restroom easily. I didn't film the process of me sewing this envelope chemise or combination underwear because it is so straightforward. It's literally just a rectangle. You take the fullest measurement of your body, so on mine that is my full hip and that is 41 inches, and then you add two to that and then divide it to two because you're making two rectangles, and then so that is 21 inches on my body, and then the height, you want it to come to upper thigh level, so slightly below like your crotch, so that it cle there's clear room towards your crotch. Because you don't want it too tight in that area because then it will be uncomfortable to move in. So on my body, I made it 27 inches. I could have actually gotten away with 25 because I put a lace on top, but I wouldn't want to go much lower than that. And then I just sewed the squares together and left a little bit open in the hip and then added another rectangle that I tie, uh, sewed onto the back and then added buttons so that it's buttons on the front. And that rectangle is two, two and a half inches times eight inches. And that's literally it. Then I just added lace to embellish it and then little strappy th things to keep it up. And then you can add as much lace and embroidery as you want because this is really an era of really pretty dainty underwear. And here are the finished undergarments. the resulting silhouette from all the underwear. They transform my body from a 38 inch bust to a 34 and a half inch bust. My waist goes from my natural 28 inches to a 29 and a half inch waist. My upper hip on the other hand goes from its natural 39 inches to a 37 inch. And my low hip stays the same at 41 inches. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did please hit that like button if you haven't already and subscribe if you want to see me again next time. Bye!